Warp speed, put your seat belts on. Godspeed. When God touches your children, it changes your life. All teenagers stay in the building. Unless you are absolutely helping in the back, all teenagers stay in the building. I got that direct word last week. Rhea, she'll keep them back there. Matthew, got it? Matthew chapter 9, are you comfortable? One reason I had to cut you off, Stephen, is that what you're saying goes so much with the message. Hopefully, we can gather some of this in here. There's such a need. When there's a need with your children, and many of the people in the church here have heard me speak about my, my needs, my kids, be pretty transparent about it. But I want to talk to you today when, when you've got to break the rules. Sometimes you have, there are rules that get set up. I broke the rules during the pandemic. I refused to bend to what I was told by all the things that were being said. I thought a lot of it was, uh, in, was governmental control, and so I broke the rules, and I uh, continued to do that. I found that in my life I broke the rules when I protested against abortion. I broke the rules, and I paid the price for it. I was arrested, but I also got blessed with three children that I got to adopt. So God has blessed me. Sometimes you've got to break the rules. And uh, during school times, when you break and you have worship service 24-7, you're breaking the rules. You know that. You're supposed to be in class. But, again, the administration realizes it makes for better students if we break the rules. Jesus said in Matthew 9, verse 10, while he was having dinner at Matthew's house, Matthew was a tax collector. Don't you love the IRS? Say amen. I didn't think I'd get a lot of amens on that one. So at dinner at Matthew's house, and many tax collectors. I mean, he brought in all the IRS. They all came in, and quote, unquote, sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. Now understand this. Uh, the word sinner and tax collectors are synonymous. Okay. And, and when the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, Pharisees being religious people, uh, self-righteous people, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Hearing this, Jesus said, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. Hear me again. It's not the healthy that needs a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, for I have not come to call the righteous but sinners. Father, I thank you for the word. I thank you for the opportunity to break down this bread and let your people feed in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Again, if you're taking notes, snap pictures of the overhead because we're going to be moving quickly here. Jesus said, go and learn what this means. Acts chapter 1 verse 1 tells us that, uh, that Jesus, everything that he did came with touching and telling to do and to teach. Everything that he did, you, it's so simple. I remind myself of all the great facets of ministry and church life and everything I see. I have to keep life simple. I've got to keep my me message simple. I've got to keep a ministry simple. And I learned this from Jesus. The ministry of Jesus did two things. It's all he came to do. If you study his life from the time of his baptism, actually back to when he was a young 11 and 12 year old, up through his life until the cross, he was only doing two things. It's a trustworthy saying that desires full acceptance. Jesus came to, into the world to save sinners. And again, Paul said, in which I'm the worst. All of us can take that title, being the worst of, that he came to save us. Can I get an amen? Amen. The second thing Jesus came to do is something that we needed help with because we didn't have the power to do it. For 5,000 years, this devil has roamed this land. The lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. He's attacked people with the same addictions over and over again. He's told them that their identity was wrong. He messed up their self-esteem. Amen. He told them all the time that you've got to have certain doctors. And so Jesus Jesus, the Bible says that he disarmed the powers and authorities. He made a public spectacle of them, triumphant over them by the cross. When Jesus died on the cross, he disarmed the devil. And I said this uh, uh, to our group yesterday. If the devil has been disarmed, if the devil has been defeated, if he has no arms and no feet, why are you scared of him? 
I said, if he has no arms, he has no feet, why are you scared of him? He's a talking torso. Now, that matters because as a talking torso, he is still able to uh, condemn us and say things against us. Are you following me? Amen. I'm not scared of any physical thing getting happened, but to hear that say. So the vision of this house has always been threefold. We're here to win the lost. We're here to integrate the body, and we're here to nurture people. We want people to grow in God. We want them to learn in God. We want to integrate. We want to see integer, which means uh, integrity. It brings forth wholeness in the body. To not be afraid of where people's culture, where they came from, uh, but learn how to connect with the gospel and to win the lost. We're called to be fishers of men, not cleaners of fish. So we go after people. We win people whatever we can. Next week we'll have Beast Feast out at the ranch. I'll invite men. Men, you've got to show up. You've got to bring your friends. We've seen men get saved and delivered at this Beast Feast. They come out expecting to archery and skeet and all the things. And we're going to have fun, guys. We're going to have a great time. But on the flip side, there's going to be some spiritual nourishment also that's going to affect the lives of men. Because when men get together, things happen. Can I get an Amen. Amen. So according to, to Luke chapter 4, and again, Jesus was a, a young, he was a preteen, if you would. He understood Acts in Luke chapter 4. He quotes out of the Old Testament being a, he, he does it. Somebody said, well, man, Jesus learned the Bible. He was the Bible. Amen. He was the Word. In the beginning was the, the Word, and the Word was God. The Spirit of the Lord, he said, is upon me. That's got to be an amazing thing. You know, you, you mentioned, Stephen, that the young people there. I've, I've known young people at all of these campuses, and I'm here in different, at ORU right now, different places like that. There's, there's young people there that are, it's a new depth in God. In other words, there's an intimacy. There's a growing in him. And Jesus goes into a temple, which has regular church services all the time, and he pulls out Isaiah 61, and he says to the people there, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me. Words empowered. He empowered me to preach the gospel to the poor. That's the bankrupt. What did I tell you in the beginning? Pay attention, because if you miss the beginning of the message, you're not going to catch the end of it. That two things several, to separate this. Understand that, first off, everybody needs a doctor who's sick, Jesus said. Then he goes on to say this, that I came to save sinners and destroy the devil. So when you look at this little capsule in, in Luke, amen, the fourth chapter, he said, I came to help the poor. I came to tell the poor that they don't have to stay poor, that the poor say I'm rich. Amen. That's what the Scripture teaches. you got to change the way you think. Amen. In other words, I can't keep giving you stuff and make you change. If I keep giving you stuff, you'll just sell what I gave you. If I keep giving you stuff, you'll hoard it up. If I keep giving you stuff, you'll still have that poor mentality because it's an attitude. So i got to talk to you i got to break that spirit you got, so I'm going to talk to you. Then he said, I came to, uh, he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Brokenhearted people you touch. I've, I've told you this forever. When somebody's heart is broke, you don't talk to them. What are you going to say at a funeral of somebody whose 30-year-old wife just died? How are you going to help them? What you do is you touch them. You put your arm around them. You kiss them on the cheek. You remind them that life can get better here. You, you, you just, you, you just got to be with them because their heart's broke. When you deal with people whose hearts are broken, you, what do you have to say? Would you, are you going to say something dumb like, I know how you feel? So be careful around people. You, I, you mean well, believer. You mean well, but you got to be careful. You just got to be with them. When the hearts are broken, when, when something's wrong with a child or, or they've gone through uh, relational issues in their life. So Jesus said, I came, I came to touch that broken heart. Amen. If I can touch that broken heart, I can heal that broken heart. I came to proclaim liberty to the captives, those that are bound with vices and habits. I came to tell them, listen, when you go into a place and they want to, uh, and you got to change, your playmates, playground, and playthings got to change. If they don't change, you don't change. So in life, I got to hear the word of God. What set me free from addiction? It wasn't somebody. I have a friend years ago, he was dealing with a guy who was a drug addict, and what he did is he, he bound him in chains, honest to God, locked him in chains, and put him in the back of his tire shop, left him there. He thought, now I'm going to get him delivered. He didn't get him delivered. <laughs> he got him mad is what he got him. Amen. You can't just hold somebody down and make you. You can't just keep saying. I mean, when I got born again, I would, I would go, I'd pull up somebody's car. I'd pull, pour the beer out. I'd, I'd throw out their cigarettes and undo their joints. I did not make friends. I found out it was the Word of God that changes us. Amen. So Jesus said, what I came to do, I came to set them at liberty to the captives. I wanted to talk to them. I wanted the Word of God to have a chance to touch them. And recovery of sight to the blind. Spiritually blind people need touching. 
They can't, they, they can't see what you're talking about. They hear, it's the hearing of the word that changes them. But listen to me. In recovery is sight to the blind. If I want the blind to see, I got to touch them. In other words, I got to wash their car. I got to babysit their kids. I got to get rid of their cat. I got to do something for them. Amen. If I can do something for them, their eyes will open. Can I get an amen? Amen. It's very important as we walk through this. So what I'm looking for in life, Jesus said, only the righteous don't need a doctor, but those that are sick. There at times has to be another opinion. I have found before the final verdict, the medical system tells me this. If the test came back positive, you have a right to a specialist to get another opinion. Whenever you go to a doctor, you don't always have to listen to the doctor right off the bat. Can I get an amen? Because doctors oftentimes, they're practicing medicine. That's the loophole. That's how they get away with a botched surgery. I have a friend that went in for surgery. Only had, he had a heart, by, a, a, a heart bypass, had it done. They pulled an artery out of his knee, yanked the artery out, put it here. Now he's in danger of losing his leg. Doctor said, not our fault. We're practicing. Amen. He's been, now it's been four months, five months he's been in and out of the hospitals with this. Bacteria. We, and we got nurses here. They know exactly what I'm talking about. But here's one thing I cannot stand. I can't stand a narcissistic doctor who has a God complex that thinks just because they're a doctor, they have the ability to heal you and they ought to get all the credit. I'm telling you, I thank God for our medical, but I, there are times I'll hear news and I want to say I want a second opinion. I want somebody to give me another idea how this thing can work. Is there another way we can do this? Amen. In the judicial system, it's the same way. If you go to court and you don't like the decision that your judge had, there's a court of appeals. They can appeal it and you get a second chance. You get another opportunity at that. Biblically speaking, Revelation chapter 12 verse 10 says, Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ for the accuser of our brothers who accuses them before uh, our God day and night has been hurled down. Jesus said he saw Satan fall from heaven. When he got here to the earth, Jesus defeated, disarmed him, but he said, I heard a voice saying, he's never stopped accusing you. He remembers your past. He was a part of your past. He calls your past. Amen. He helped influence the, the addictions that you walked in, the bad decisions that you had, all the things that I've gone through in my life that have never been God-ordained. Amen. Often has a satanic influence to it. So he stands there and he accuses you because he knows your past. One thing he forgot was that Jesus forgave it. Amen. And he says, then they overcame, listen to this, they overcame him, speaking of Satan, by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. This is where we're heading, that last part, because many of us, we love life too much. I love life. You love life, I love life. But eventually, we got to let go of this life and prepare for the next life. Can I get an amen? We only got a little time here. We got a lot of time there, so make sure you make that time there count more than here. But the Scripture says their testimony, how they shared what God had done in their life. Amen. It's so important. Steve, that's why I allowed you to get up this morning. I wanted you to say something to remind you that when you back on that ladder and you're working on them houses and you say to yourself, I don't feel it anymore because it's going to happen, my brother. I've been through it myself. I don't feel this anymore. It ain't happening anymore. And then God's going to speak and say, do you remember when you stood up at the little country church and testified what God did at Asbury, Kentucky? And you got to say, yay, Lord, I'm overcoming by the blood of the Lamb and the Word of my testimony. Amen. That's why it's important to share what you've done and what you've gone through in life. You speak it forward, it reminds you what God did in your life. You've got to say it. Everybody say, say it. Say it. So by the word of their testimony was so important. There are times in life that we forget how Satan, Satan's after. I mean, he will accuse you. He will accuse you four ways. First way, he will accuse you. He will slander you before God. You ain't no good. Amen. You nothing with dirt. You should have never been born. God said, I never thought of you and sent you to the womb to, to Texas. Should have never done it. Amen. He will slander us before ourselves. He will remind us of our past. Amen. Even David said in Psalm 51, my sin is ever before me. I remind myself of my sin, my failure, my missteps. Number three, he will accuse us to others. The scripture says that uh, Jesus looked at a woman who had been caught in the very sin of adultery. Amen. At that moment, he looked and said, where are your accusers? Amen. Friends will, enemies will, acquaintances will accuse you. Bring up your past. Amen. In front, and this is a devilish thing. Always reminding you. Listen, we all got triggers. We all got buttons. And it seems like the enemy knows exactly where they're at. 
Mm -hmm. And the fourth way, he will try to accuse God. He will try to accuse God by saying to us, if God loved you, you wouldn't be depressed all the time. If God loved you, you wouldn't be struggling financially all the time. If God loved you, you wouldn't have that big nose. If God loved you, you wouldn't be going through what you're going through. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins. And he'll purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim that we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar. And his word will not have any place in our lives. You know, one of the easiest things I have found in life is to say, I know I have sinned. I have never sat back and said, no, I've never sinned. Amen. I've never done that. I, I, that. It's the easiest thing just to give in on that moment and say, you know, I have sinned, but I'm going to tell you something else. I've asked God to forgive me of my sins. Yeah. I've turned from sins. I've, I've, I've pushed away from that. I've, I've allowed God to begin to change my life. doesn't mean perfection, but the bottom line is, be honest with you, I need a doctor. I'm looking for a doctor. I'm looking for somebody that can heal this heart, touch this mind. Amen. Make this body well. I'm looking for a doctor. That's why this passage means so much to me. In Mark chapter 4, when Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him and while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue rulers, a pastor by the name of Jairus, came there seeing Jesus. He fell at his feet and he pleaded earnestly with him. My little daughter is dying. I want to tell you this. You never give thanks to God for what you got until you start to lose it. And when you start to lose health, when you start to lose relationships, when you start to lose this life that you've been holding on to so dearly here, you'll start thanking God for what you got left. Amen. It'll shift in your life. There ought to be more amens than that. Amen. amen. My little girl's dying. Please come and put your hands on her that she may be healed and live. Huh? You telling me this? You want me to come? So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. A woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had, yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I touch his clothes, I'll be healed. She made up her mind that if she made this move toward the doctor, something would happen. Immediately, her bleeding stopped. She felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, Who touched my clothes? Huh. You see, the people crowding against you, his disciples answered, and yet you can ask, Who touched me? You ask that? One translation said it was Peter that answered this question. But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. When the woman, knowing what had done to her, came and fell at his feet and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be free from your suffering. The Message Bible says in verse 34, And Jesus said to her, Daughter, you took a risk of faith. Stephen, Mandy, you took a risk of faith. No money you stepped out, God provided. When you take a risk of faith, believing God for something that doctors say can't happen, the world says it can't be done, even when you take a risk of faith, the Scripture says, Jesus said, now you're healed, you're whole, live well, live blessed, be healed of your plague. I'll say it again. You're healed, you're whole, live well, Live blessed, be whole of your plague. We got a dilemma here. This woman is bleeding to death. For 12 years, she struggled. When I first heard people preach this message, and even when I read it in college, I thought of her being an elderly woman. Since, I changed my mind. She's at the age, probably 12, 13 years old, when a change of life came over her. I believe she's probably 24, 25 years old now. She's moved through the most basic, wonderful times of her life when she should have been enjoying life, when she should have been connecting with people, when she should have had relationship, when she should have been part of the Ford Youth Group and all of these things. But now she has found herself an outsider. She has issues in her life. Amen. We read that it's serious that nobody could help her. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors. 
issues. She went to doctor after doctor after doctor with her issue. The blood would not stop. It kept flowing in her life. She was near death, I believe, in this situation. She grew worse. The Bible says instead of getting better. I don't know, have you ever been to the hospital? Instead of getting better, you got worse. Hey, Amen. You just got worse. She just hit you a little bit harder. You got you picked up something there that, that you didn't have on the outside, but you found it when you got there. Again, I'm not trying to slam our medical community, but I'm telling you this. They're not always the answer. Amen. Sometimes a solid faith, a risk of faith. Amen. Believe in God because we will spend thousands and thousands, insurance company, millions and millions trying to keep us well, and we won't spend 10 minutes before prayer time with God and ask him to turn and change our life. Amen. Won't give a nickel toward that. And yet God says, look, if you're hungry, if you come to me, I believe I can change things in your life. Amen. But you just got to do it. This woman had a problem. Amen. Her problem was the religious rules of the day stated that she was unable to connect, be around, or even socialize with anybody else. She had to stay on the outside. She had to use the word unclean when people were around her. She was not allowed to associate with other people. She had rules on her, and we have rules on us today. Many of us come with, with rules that have bound us from our past that our parents told us. Some of us have rules of thinking that God is afar off and that he's not near. Some of us believe that God is just an old man on a, on a, a throne somewhere that's just going to let us smooth on through the world until we're dead and then we'll figure it out. I don't believe that. I believe God is active in our lives. I believe he's connected with us now. I believe he cares about us now. And he's watching to see how we're going to handle life. And here at this moment, Jesus is coming through a crowd. A crowd's got him. A man has him by the hand. He's pleading for him, save my little daughter. She's 12 years of age. And at this moment, as this crowd is pressing on him, Jesus feels a touch from a woman that had issues. Anybody in here know anybody with issues? Don't look around. Isolated, ridiculed, her sense of inferiority became even deeper and more hurtful. The issues, this current that flowed through her, it was an outflow of an eternal problem. Her issue had gone into overtime. It isolated her from pivotal relationships. It humiliated her. It depleted her resources. She had given all she had to doctors, was none the better, had suffered many things of these physicians. Amen. Spent all that she had. My friend, she's broke. She's at the bottom. Her, her health is, what else you going to do? I done seen Dr. Blue, Dr. Yellow, Dr. Red. I done seen all the doctors. But I'm searching for a doctor. Amen. I'm hunting for a doctor. Amen. He said only the, the sick need a doctor. Well, I qualify. Amen. I'm sick. I'm spiritually sick. I'm physically sick. sick. I'm mentally sick. I qualify. Amen. And when she heard Jesus. Who was saying Jesus? It had to be the pastor that was pulling his hand. Jesus, come and save my little girl. Help my little girl. And her, she had to push down all of uh, everything inside of her. The rules, the rules, the rules keep coming up. Did you know you're allowed to break the rule for life? You know you're allowed to run a red light if you're trying to get somebody to the hospital to save their life? You're allowed to break rules at times. Many of you would sit there at that stop sign with somebody bleeding to death in your car because you're so self-righteous you don't want to break a law. I'm going to bust some speed limits. I'm zipping through some red lights. Amen. I got folk that are in need here. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. Folk always ask me, how do you get from one church to another church? I just pointed at one of my very fast vehicles. All right, it's about life, man. It ain't about law right now. Can I get an amen? After 12 years of false illusions and dashed hopes, come on up here, Jojo. Amen. She left her doctors and decided to get a second opinion. I've got to get it. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd. Faith comes from hearing and hearing the word of God. Faith comes from hearing. She took a risk of faith. Amen. Faith comes from hearing in here, why a testimony is so important? Because faith comes from hearing and hearing the word of God. When you read the Bible, I I, I was a, a blessed with a pastor friend of mine named 
Leslie Smith, skinniest preacher you ever seen. He was from uh, uh, Tennessee. I'm trying to think of the name of the little town in Tennessee, south of Nashville. He could pull his pants up right below his rib cage. Amen. He was a farmer. Leslie Smith. Amen. He was born, amen, with a desire to work. Calloused hands. Worked behind the plow of a mule. Amen. Amazing preacher. Uh, amazed me. Leslie Smith is coming back to me. I sat in a hotel with him one night on the way to a funeral of another pastor. Amen. And I was awoke to hear him reading his Bible out loud. He was reading page after page out loud. And I looked over at, at, a, at another pastor I was with, and I said, why is he reading that Bible out loud? He said, you don't understand. This man is illiterate. He doesn't know how to read. He, does, he was never taught in school. He, he got out of school early to take care of his family. God gave him the ability to read. And the only thing he reads is the Word of God. And he sits there every morning. You say, Pastor, that's crazy. You call it crazy. You won't. I believe it because I saw that jumping preacher Act up. He would read that Bible out loud so he could hear it. Because hearing, faith come by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. He was listening to it over and over and over again. I love that old man. I've been raised around some really good country preachers. Amen. It, it made me who I am. Hallelujah. When she heard of Jesus, she immediately put aside all her fears. Faith rose up inside of her. Jairus is pulling on him. Come and heal my daughter. Hebrews 4.16, let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. There were thrones that she'd been before. She'd sat before the doctors and nothing got better. The judicial system told her she had to be an outlier and stay on the outside and she couldn't touch people. It was a law. But she decided, you know what, it's time to break the law. It's time to break any law that takes life from me. And when she heard of Jesus, she came through the crowd, and she touched the hem of his garment. Now, I want to say this to you, and you need to hear me. There were a lot of people touching Jesus. Jairus was touching Jesus. The crowd pressed. The NIV, the King James Version says the crowd pressed on Jesus. There's a lot of people that come to church and press Jesus. There's a lot of people that have revivals that press on Jesus, but he's not impressed with them. He's impressed with somebody that has faith, that's hungry, that wants the Word of God. They want Him. And the Scripture says she reached through and she touched the hem of His garment. See, I've got this imagination that runs wild. When she touched the hem, sister, imagine, sis, getting to live again. Imagine having the disease and the plague dry up. Imagine being with the doctor. I need a doctor. I need a doctor. And she reached through and touched the hem. And when she did, she knew she was healed. And Jesus stopped in the middle. He said, who touched me? You serve a sensitive God who feels your infirmities, the Scripture says. He's sensitive toward you, Connor. He knows what you're thinking, even in school. He's sensitive toward you. He feels your hurt. He feels your pain. He feels your disappointments. He feels the fact that you failed in life and, and, and that there was a satanic issue over you. And yet at this moment, at this moment, you touched him. And when you touched him, everything changed. You drew something from him. One word calls it virtue, power, anointing. You drew healing from him. And he stopped and said, who touched me? Now, I'll be honest with you. That pastor, Pastor Jairus, did not want Jesus to stop. He's got a daughter who's dying. She's 12 years old. You can't stop. You can't stop. But Jesus stopped. And he looked around and said, who, 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 who just got healed? Who just got blessed? Can I tell you, there was a lot of people in that crowd that probably need healing. And he looked at her and he said, daughter, <laughs> look at you, girl. What's up with you? Amen. At that moment, he said to her, go in peace. Be set free from your plague. And again, the message uses the word wholeness. Wholeness is such a powerful word. See, many get saved, but not everybody gets whole. Whole has to do with four things. Identity, knowing who you are. 
Today, I've never seen such a mixed up, messed up identity where people don't know who they are. They, they make up their mind. They think they know. They decide themselves who they are. Parents let them decide themselves who they are. My identity was set. I am a male child of God. It's set. Amen. I know who I am. I'm his child. Second, security, knowing everything's going to be all right. I, I want to back up to that, to that word out of the message that said, amen. She took a, a risk of faith, and now you're healed and whole. Live well. Live blessed. Be whole of your plague. Security. You know everything's going to be all right. He said to her, you don't know your future yet, but I do. You're going to be blessed. You're going to be holy your plague. You know what he was telling her? Get dating, girl. Go find you a M-A-N. Get on out there. Mingle with everybody. Go back to your family again. Break the law. It's all good. Amen. Security. I know I'm going to heaven. Acceptance. Knowing you're loved. At that moment of crisis, she knew she was the most loved person that around. Even Jairus couldn't say anything because he stopped and he touched that woman. Amen. Set her free. And purpose, knowing why you're here. Amazing. I want to tell you something, church. Before you allow fate to slam the gavel of man's opinion down against you, and before you call the family of God around your bedside to relinquish your calling and your salvation, you need another opinion. You can tell God, I, I want to touch you. I want to get hold of you. I want to tell you, church, only the sick need a doctor. Only the, and I've gone to doctors. I've had appointments for things in my life. And I'll go back and I'll go back and I sit in waiting rooms. And I wait and I wait and I go in and I get a 15-minute consultation. And I pay big bucks and I walk away. And it could be over the muscular dystrophy. It could be over uh, anything in my body that I'm struggling with. And you've done the same thing. And we do it over and over again. And we're none the better sometimes. Sometimes we get better, sometimes we don't. But my faith is in God. My faith is in Him. But the moment that Jesus said that to that girl, your faith has made you whole. You took a risk of faith. Be blessed and go on with your life. The story ain't over. The story goes on that Jairus gets Jesus to his house. When he got there, there was wailing and crying going on. Again, those that were part of the law were there. It was the law to wail and to cry over the death of somebody to make them a commotion. And the Bible says Jesus took Peter, James, and John. Believe me, there's a circle of friends around you that love you more than you realize. And those are the people you need to agree in prayer for. I never read where Jesus says, hey, Thomas, go with me. Never read it. But Pete and JJ, he took with him all the time. They were his favorites. Yeah, he has favorites. He who favors the Father, the Father he will favor. So they go into the room with him. And Jesus looks at the little girl, and there's mama, there's daddy. And he says to her, Talatha kumai, rise. Little girl, get up. I missed something here. Go back to the woman with the issue of blood. Do you remember what Jesus called her? Daughter. 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 Not woman. Called his mama at the cross woman. But here he calls this girl daughter. If I call you daughter, Donna, what's that mean? That I'm your daddy. Amen. Now I'm not. Well, I'm your pastor. But I want you to hear me. When somebody calls you daughter or son, they're taking a place of or assembling of or have a semblance of a father or a mother. So when he said daughter to her, you want to hear some sweet words? When that phone rings and I hear the word, hey, Paul, Paul. <laughs> what you want, boy? What you want? Well, you want me to fly you down here from Colorado? What you want? You want the word, Paul, Paul. Change your life. Dad. Dad. Jesus. Daughter, your faith has made you whole. Go in peace. Be free from your plague. He called me daughter. He 
called me daughter. He called me his daughter. Then he has to be my father. I've been without a dad for 12 years. Been isolated, kicked out, moved away under the law. But today, I'm free. He broke the rules for me. And I broke the rules for my daughter. He gets to the house and there's a 12-year-old there. She's lying stiff. The wife says, why did you bring Jesus? Why did you bring Jesus? Your little girl has passed away. I sent a runner to tell you that. You should have already got the text message. And he said, "Hun, I want to say something to you. The testimony is of a woman who was for 12 years sick. And I heard her say, I'm well. I heard Jesus call her daughter. And then no longer will the plague bother her. I saw the smile on her face as she started touching the crowd and the crowd started touching her. Baby, I'm going to tell you, you may not believe this, but I heard it with my own ears. I heard the testimony of the healing of the woman of 12 years. Now I believe he has to touch her. And he touches the little girl. And he says, Talatha Kumai. Little girl rise. And she rose. The excitement with Peter and James and John. Jesus knew it would happen. Jairus embraces his daughter, hugs his wife, family back together again. It's only the sick that need a doctor. We need to seek after the doctor. Heads, y'all stand with me. Come on, y'all just get up with me. If I, hey, y'all, can I get a couple of prayer warriors up here? Amen again one more time. Those that pray with me, if y'all get those that come up and like to pray. I'm going to ask you this morning. I don't mind being late today. There's faith in this house. I don't know what your need is, but I know he knows. And I can tell you, you will go. Sometimes you'll come to church and you'll pray one time for one thing. And then you walk away and say, well, God didn't hear it. I am tenacious about asking again. I learned it from my children. My grandkids, they'll ask again, and they will wear you out until you give in. It's like the Syrophoenician woman. <laughs> she kept asking Jesus. He said, I've never seen such faith. She keeps believing. She keeps wanting it. Now, I'm not going to put her aside. So if you need prayer today, if you need to reach for the hymn, she touched the hymn. The hymn is where all the threads come together. You know about life falling apart Well, she reached for where it was back together. Maybe you're praying for somebody today and you want to agree with them. Come on up right now. Amen. Move right now. Move quickly. We don't have much time, but move quickly. Gather around these. Amen. I'll pray with you. Others will pray with you. In the name of Jesus, thank you, Lord. Amen. I tell you what, why don't we do this? Just stretch your hands forward. Come on, stretch your hands forward. Father, whatever needs Susan has right now in the name of Jesus, I thank you for touching it. Lord, as she reaches for your him, grab hold of this hand. Touch her hand and let her know yes. Yes for her family. Yes for her body. Yes for her mind, soul, and spirit. God, I thank you for Terry. This grandma, this great-grandma, she's been through so much in life. She stood in the gap for her husband. God, for her children. I thank you in the name of Jesus that you touch Terry. Give her that which she believes for. God, this woman has been a woman of faith as long as I have known her. It's over 30 years. So I thank you, God, in the name of Jesus as she reaches forward. Touch her body. Touch her mind. Touch her spirit. Whatever she's agreeing for in Jesus' name. I thank you for doing it for Terry in Jesus' name. God, I thank you for Dana. I thank you for her children. She's gone through transitions in life. She's wondered, why me, God? I pray in the name of Jesus, you touch her. Touch her, God. Reach out. Touch her as she reaches toward you. She's heard the no's. She's heard the, the, the excuses. But right now, God, all she's got is faith in you. So in the name of Jesus, I'm believing that you're going to touch and turn this thing around in her life. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen, Mandy? In Jesus' name. 
In Jesus' name, God, I thank you for my sister. I thank you that she has faith to push her husband, her children. God, that she believes you for the best. Lord, she's not going to just accept any verdict except that which says that she's going to get what she believes in God for. There's tenaciousness in this woman. There's a desire to hang on, that bulldog tenacity. God, I thank you in the name of Jesus for her children, her family. God, don't let that faith be in vain. God, let she reach and touch you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen. Come on, give God praise in this house. <laughs> Woo! Somebody say break the rules. Come on, say it again. My God, Protestants, that's what we're all about is breaking the rules. Amen. Don't put a rule on us that tells us we can't serve God and love God, Charlie. We won't do it. We won't stand for it. Amen. Don't tell me I can't have a gun. I'd rather have one not need it than need one not have it. Amen. God bless you. you. May be seated. Don't be scared to give today. Don't be scared to give today. You give by faith. You save by faith. You heal by faith. You reach out to God by faith. Don't be afraid to give today. Give of your. I told our group last yesterday. I said I, I believe God for the tithe, but when it comes for the offering, that's my fault. The offering's on me. If we need an offering for, for chairs, an offering for air conditioning, we need an offering, that's on me. I got, as, a, as the house leader, I got to stand up and say, listen, we, we got to have this, that, and the other. So offerings are on me. But the tithe, tithe is on you. You got to decide to honor God with your giving. Amen. We have uh, next week, Beast Feast. I'm going to say it again, Beast Feast. We got a savage 30 alt 6 I got to give to somebody. A savage 30 off said, you show up, you stay till the end, we give you a ticket. Amen, we draw your name, you get a 30 off six. We got a, a radical, uh, a, a beast relay we're going to do. I need uh, eight, ten men, you know, I got to gather together to do certain specific things. And then we're going to compete throughout the day. We got Pastor David Hilton, Pastor Jason, amen. We got Shiloh Men's Ministry coming out. It's going to be a great time. I need you to bring your chilies. Sister, make him some chili, let him claim it's his. Put it in a crock pot and bring it out. Amen. Everybody got your offering? Everybody love God today? Amen. As we give today, we're believing God for? More money, less hours. Benefits, sales and commission, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, settlements, inheritance, rebates and returns, debts demolished, royalties received, favor and success to the kingdom. Amen. Pastor David, if you come. <laughs>